Uh, right now we're going to talk about grouse, uh, and I have a, a, an extremely, um, well I don't know what should we call you, esteemed, memorable, uh, senior panel of grouse experts sitting here. Um, right beside me is Andrew Fallis, who's from Carter Jonas. Uh, he uh, buys and sells grouse moors. Uh, we have Mark Osborne, uh, who runs the wonderful gun making firm William Powell, and is extremely involved in, in grouse moor management. Uh, and Adrian Blackmore from the Countryside Alliance, uh, who is, are you head of shooting? Is that head, exactly, in charge of shooting. In charge of shooting at the Countryside Alliance, what a fantastic title. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, can I start with you, Mark? Um, the first and obvious question are, uh, is grouse prospects for this season. How's it looking? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, everybody is going to equivocate when you are at the end of July on grouse, which won't start until August the 12th. And if you try and give a summary of a national picture that runs from the Staffordshire, Cheshire, Derbyshire border in the Peak District being the most southern driven grouse moors up and through the highlands uh, of Scotland. You've got an enormous disparity. Then you go from almost the, the uh, west coast in the Trough of Boland and across the North Yorkshire moors on the east coast of Yorkshire. You can imagine the, the range that you're going to get. So a glib summary is pretty difficult. Where the grouse are this year is uh, on the back of uh, two, and in the, as you go into the highlands, the middle of Scotland, the highlands, on the back of four varyingly bad years. Last year was probably overall, I think in the UK, the worst grouse year since 1995. Areas have been worse than they were last year, but overall, so you take from the Southern Peak District up to the Far Highlands, last year was the worst we have experienced since 95. We have counts this time of year, we have on the moors that we look after from the Peak District up through north of England, south of Scotland, and into the Highlands with counts coming in for grouse. And the picture this year is incredibly varied. It's always varied, and we always try and put caveats in, but it's, I think it's actually more varied this year. The, the, the main thing with grouse, they're a wild bird, and therefore they require mums and dads. And if you had a very low stock in the spring, because of last year being very poor breeding and the previous year being very poor breeding, then you are going to have a very small population to breed from. And if you didn't have the stock in the spring, you're not going to have a lot of grouse this year, even though in the main they have bred pretty well and in some places very well indeed. So the moors that have got grouse in quantities of good shootable surface this year are those moors which had left at the end of last season, if they were able, a reasonable stock. That reasonable stock, if it's in good condition, and most of the grouse seem to be in good condition going into this spring, and this spring and summer has been good weather-wise for grouse pretty well everywhere. It's been as good as you're going to get. You've got grouse. So in parts of the country, we've got a really good lot of grouse, but that's dependent on the level of stock you had to breed from. That, that is, that is a, the longest version of the curate's egg I've heard, actually. Well done. Uh, Adrian, could you add to that, please? Is that working? Yeah. Uh, I think the important thing to remember is that no two grass are the same. Everyone is different, given different altitude, the direction they face. Um, some are wetter moors than others. Um, so it is very difficult to paint an overall picture. As Mark said, it is very varied this year. Some more central North Pennines are looking really good. The western edge of the North Pennines are looking doomingly good. Um, again, you know, if one more chance announced in May that they thought it probably was going to be a shoot, uh, shoot at all, didn't have a sustainable shoot, uh, surface to shoot. The same thing happened last year with another more which said exactly the same, but come October, they are actually shooting at some good sized bags. So it is very difficult to predict. What we are hoping though is for a really good season, where it can be, because it is so important, not just for the guns, for the owners, it's a whole community. 
It's all those employed on a casual basis on a shoot day, whether it's beaters, flankers, laders, those involved in cooking, all the businesses reliant on teams of guns coming in. It is so important to our rural communities in the uplands. So we are really hoping for the best season it can be, but it will be very. Thank you. We need grouse shooting. Could you just pass it back to Mark? Before I come to you, Andrew, could I, uh, uh, Mark, could I just ask um, prices of grouse this year? Where, where are we, given that pheasants are probably rarer than grouse? Uh, we probably let grouse shooting much earlier than we let the main of our partridge and pheasant shooting. So when we were letting grouse shooting was at the end of last season, doing a lot of continuity days, from same two days from last year into this year, and so we agreed pricing at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. We didn't know the disaster of avian flu, avian flu in France until after those dates. So a lot of grouse shooting was actually let in January and February, and we really only became aware of the avian flu and the difficulty of supply of pheasants and partridges end of February, March time. So grouse shooting, early grouse shooting has been let, uh, the cheapest I would know would be 160, 165 a brace for driven shooting. It's crept up to 200 pounds a brace in the last, um, the more recent ones because of A, a shortage and B, people are switching. I mean, if you think that statistic, which is that 75% of all UK partridges are sourced from France, that's a hell of a reduction in partridges put down and therefore people looking to have sun shooting and switching to grouse shooting if they can get it rather than September and October partridge. Okay, imagine I'm a very, very dim hedge fund manager, not hard to do, and if you imagine I'm that and I'm coming to you today for something on the 12th of August in around about the 100 brace area, how much could you rinse me for? I couldn't even, but I would love you to be. So, I mean, my arms would be all round you and I'd be grasping for your checkbook. But sadly, you, I could not let you any grouse shooting on the 12th of August. <laughs> Thank you. Honest answer. Uh, Andrew, the, uh, the capital values uh, of uh, grouse moors, after four bad seasons, that must have an effect because you're stuck with the valuation system, aren't you? Where when people buy and sell grouse moors, it's based on an average. Uh, Thank you. Yes, um, the marketplace has evolved in such a fashion that uh, grouse moors tend to look at 10-year averages. So the last five, five and ten, ten hopefully gives you much more of a, um, a, a view of a moor and, um, and the productivity that it's produced. I think that um, we've certainly seen uh, purchasers being much more choosy about what they're looking at. Um, the perfect moor doesn't exist from what was said earlier, everything is completely different. Um, there are uh, certainly different facets that come into play when, when looking at moors, in particular the fixed equipment that's available. Um, often third party rights, I think Mark, you probably agree with me on that, as to you know, the impact of graziers, um, the layout of the moor, um, where it sits, all just plays into whether it's a single day or it's a double day moor. Um, and the ability and the, um, the opportunity for um, entertaining, whether there's a lodge available, all of this comes into play. If you take those out, those elements out, in looking at, 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 um, at the transactions that are taking place that we've seen, the area that I probably am more involved with is the Pennines, um, and you're probably seeing averages between 3.3 three to 3.7, 3,700 per brace as a capital value. 3,700 pounds for brace over the five-year average? Taking a 10-year average. 10-year average. 10-year average. I think that's probably the, the, the figures that we, we, we've been seeing in the marketplace. And, and these deals are often on the market. They're, they're very often private deals, aren't they? Transactions at that level and in that marketplace generally don't come to the open market. Mark, would you agree with that? Because you're, you're involved in, in transactions as well, aren't you? Yeah, I would agree absolutely with, with that. Um, the, the distortion in the grouse moor market is not so far in England, but it's a phenomenal distortion in Scotland because of carbon capture and forestry. And we, are, we have seen it 2000 and the end of 2021 and 2022 to date, unbelievable prices being paid north of the border, particularly in southern Scotland, 
um, where, with good road access for forestry planting land and also carbon capture. And that is, um, from my perspective, and I suspect the perspective of most people here, unless they own such land or were selling it, pretty uh, depressing because planting trees on grouse moors is not good news for grouse and not great news for, in my view, much else besides. So can you describe a, a um, if there's such a thing as a typical modern grouse moor purchaser? So he, he wants, or, or moorland purchaser, he or she wants peats, presumably, because there's carbon there, um, somewhere to put trees because there's grants there, uh, somewhere to shoot perhaps or not? Well, I, I, I think um, uh, that there's a wide variety of people buying. If you're in England, where it is extremely difficult in the north of England because of SSSIs, we've probably got 85% of all heather moorland in the north of England is SSSI ground. Therefore, planting trees on it is not possible. Therefore, carbon capture by planting trees is not possible. And commercial forestry is not possible. So you're, that market is not there. We've still got a very, very, there's a demand for rich people who want to have grass spores. I think it is uh, exactly as described, but more selective now because of there's quite a lot of baggage with owning grouse moors at the current time. Not everybody wants to be in the firing line um, for doing so, but there's still a marketplace there. And uh, again, as described, you know, people will look to have, what else does it have? Does it have a lodge? Does it have some low ground? What does it have? Make it more and more attractive. And is there a premium for a, for a name? I mean, if you, if you were saying gun aside, would you be able to say, this is gun aside, you need to pay a bit more? I think there definitely was a premium. I think the sale, what was it last year, uh, of, of Wemmergill slightly surprised the marketplace. Um, this was perhaps the number one grouse moor, which didn't sell despite being on the market for a number of, of, of years, and then did ultimately sell. Um, difficult, difficult things. People, the other thing is with size of grouse moors, really interesting point. People. Um, like to go shooting, very often like to shoot for two consecutive days or three. Five, six, seven day moors, you need to be, you need to be A, very, very rich to buy them, and B, you need to have an awful lot of time plus an awful lot of friends. Well, you will get the friends if you have a great grouse moor, but you need an awful lot of time to utilise a five, six, seven day grouse moor. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, and I would think we would talk about capital values, buying it is only the start. So, Absolutely. So yeah, the, so the, 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 the costs start there really, don't they? Um, the, there has been, uh, a, a, in, the, in the staffing area, the, there has been a, a, a fall off, I, I, I think we'll see by the end of the year, in the number of gamekeepers employed on lowland estates. Um, is employment holding up on upland estates, uh, Mark? Uh, yes, it is in England, definitely not in Scotland. Um, we, see, we saw a real increase in grouse keepers over the last 20 years, 25 years, which was very, very good news indeed. Scotland, because of what's happening both on the political front, uh, that's one thing, but also on losing some of these moors, that is, th there's no job for keepers there. If you take our great friend Mr. Paulson and his rewilding, um, the employment on those estates is dreadful, because why do you need them? And that's the reality. He's only interested in carbon, really, is, 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 that, is that it? I manage an estate next door to one of his, and I have yet to determine exactly what he is interested in. Thank you. Um, Adrian, couldn't we talk about uh, the political threats to grouse shooting, uh, both in Scotland and, and in England? Before I do that, can I just um, go back a step? Yes, of course. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, the numbers do vary. But I think there are about 167 grass moors in England that are owned by 140 people. That's a very small number compared to local issues. So invariably, their price is going to be reflected in that. And also, when it comes to value of moors in, in certain England, I can think that almost without exception, more owners in England take enormous pride in the management of those moors. And they want to have and to know that if they do things very eventually in the best condition that they took it on. So the management of those moors, yes, the grass is very important. The conservation side, all the benefits of that, other wildlife is also important. They're doing it for the grass and the enjoyment of shooting the grass. 
So that would be very good for that. Right, hold, hold your microphone a tiny bit closer to your mouth, that's lovely. Um, the political threats, in start, let's start with Scotland, because that seems to be the, the biggest problem at the moment. Um, if it's in Scotland, I might ask the Scottish Director of the Council of Wales to speak on, uh, on <laughs> that. Um, he's right there. Oh, marvellous. Go up. Jake, don't come up. Uh, Jake Sweddles, who is Scottish Director of the Council of Wales. Yeah, that would be a very good idea. While he comes up, can you just give us the English version, Adrian? It's a very difficult question. Um, there are so many threats against crowd shooting, whether it's the burning, though having said that, the burning I think is workable, the way it's been done with the, the, the exceptions to the burning regulations, so you can apply for a license if, there's, if it meets the right criteria. Um, and again, you know, not, not all grass models are, are, are deep heat. Some are predominantly deep heat, others are not. That has an impact as well. So burning is clearly um, an issue. The um, control of certain uh, predators through the general license, whether it's gulls, corvids, that is having a real impact, um, which we are working hard to try and resolve. Um, I think those are probably the main ones. Right, thank you, Jay. Thank you very much for suddenly stepping in and being Scottish for us. Uh, thank you, unexpected, but thanks uh, for the uh, invite up, Adrian, anyway. Um, licensing seems to be the overriding factor throughout everything, so um, with the grass Could, ball, Just explain that, what licensing of? Uh, well, grass ball. So uh, the Scottish Government are going to be looking at uh, this coming year, or 2023, um, into licensing of grass balls, effectively. So. Um, the SNP seem to like a license, um, and whatever happens north of the border um, is scrutinised and looked at, and generally they creep south of the border. It's a lot cheaper to do north of the border, um, they can make mistakes up there, and uh, it ultimately could be um, adopted south of the border. So it tends to be a bit of a testing ground. Um, so mistakes are made up there, um, and then they tend to, I wouldn't say get it right down here, but they can look at it. They're magnified down here. Licensing seems to me to be a kind of hostage situation, whereas you are always about to be unlicensed for some either real but more likely imaginary crime. Um, yeah, absolutely. But one thing we'll say about um, Scotland at the minute is that the organisations tend to be working together much better than they have done in the past. And um, the likes of the SGA and the Northern Groups um, are putting together some really good meetings. We're getting MSPs up onto the moors. Um, we're getting the licensing bill team up onto the moors as well. Um, so there's a lot of engagement within the sector. And it's really positive, actually, because I don't think that's something that's happened necessarily um, on a regular basis in, in the past. Um, but there seems to be more of a, a, a sort of a, a one voice um, kind of aspect of things at the minute. So um, it, it's really encouraging for me to see the organisation working together and being up on moves together with the people who make the decisions. So are you in the same room as Trees for Life, for example, one of the major anti organisations? I certainly am. I've had a number of meetings with Trees for Life and uh, it, it's, it's well worth having these conversations. Some of them might be uncomfortable, um, but I, I think it's, it's well worth having the conversations and just understanding where everybody stands on particular issues. And I think you could probably move forward uh, uh, in some cases probably not work together better, but you can understand each other better and probably make better progress. We had Duncan Orr Ewing from the RSPB Scotland here yesterday who said more or less, I love gamekeepers, we employ gamekeepers, all gamekeepers are monsters. I mean, how do you deal with that? I, I saw that actually, um, I'm surprised <laughs> he actually got out of here alive uh, after, after some of those comments. Um, yeah, absolutely ludicrous. It's, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a huge misunderstanding. Um, and with the, the hunting and dogs bill as well, the six evidence sessions that we've just had, some of the claims that were made there from the likes against Verbi, against Cool Sports, RSPB, completely unfounded. Um, they're not evidence based, and we've been back to the committee. And everything, when something like this happens, the first thing we do is go to the Scottish Government and ask them to request evidence for, for whichever claims. So um, it, it's a vicious circle. The, the, the spurious claims will keep going, we'll keep asking for evidence, and uh, it's not going to change. Thank you so much, Jake. A small round of applause for Jake for stepping in and suddenly and talking about Scotland. Thank you. Um, Adrian, England, where are you? On licensing again, I mean, clearly that is a threat in the background. Um, the government's not looking at the moment at licensing grass smalls in England, but that doesn't stop the likes of the RSPB calling for the licensing of grass smalls in England, which they have done recently in conjunction with um, Greenpeace 
and um, wild moors led by a convicted animal rights um, activist Luke Steele. So the RSPB, Greenpeace and wild moors got together and it featured heavily in the media both nationally and internationally about claims that the new burning regulations are not working in England. Um, they reported something like 272 fires that had taken place illegally on sites of scientific um, interest uh, or on deep heat. And 76 of those have been reported by the RSPB using their new burning app. Um, when we looked into it slightly more, we discovered that actually, with the exception of possibly a handful, actually no more than five, which DEFRA are investigating, there was no foundation to any of those accusations made by the RSPB. So their claims that the burning regulations are not working, calls for licensing of gas laws, was complete misinformation and distorted facts. So there's a small number of people who will try and get grouse shooting at any cost, is that it? Absolutely. And the, um, the lobbying of Yorkshire Water not to renew the shooting lease on Thornton Moor is just another example. Again, that's led by Luke Steele, um, Wild Moors, um, claiming that um, peat is being burned. Well, no gatekeeper is going to intentionally burn peat because that would be totally counterproductive. Um, and claiming that wildlife is being killed, etc., etc. We we did an e-lobby um, of Yorkshire Water, which over 3,000 people um, made use of to contact the company. We've been engaging with them, or I've been engaging with them closely, sending briefing notices, some, some documents. Um, we've also had MPs who um, approached them. We have, we. Uh, all we wanted them to make their decision based on evidence and science, all of which actually supports the renewal of their police. The Luke Steel was going to lead a, uh, an aggravated trespass next weekend uh, on Yorkshire Waters, um, uh, on that reservoir outside Bradford, but he's pulled back from that and says he's going to just do campaigning in, in local cities. Do you think he's confident that uh, it's uh, going to go his way? I very much hope it's not going to go his way. The um, gathering he was going to have at Thornton Moor last week, uh, next weekend, if it had been on the moor, that would have been an, an act of trespass. You have a right, of, right to roam, you do not have a right to demonstrate on private land. Um, so he's probably quite sensible not, not doing that. Um, these these um, lobbying in Bradford and other city centres has been done before. Um, the camp, uh, campaign for um, protection of uh, modern communities, C4 PMC, um, they have, they have, they're on the case. They've counted on it. Okay, yeah. Mark, can I ask you uh, what, what it's like on, on the, the ground with the political threats um, uh, as they sort of dr drop down, rain down on you? Uh, well, I suppose we've been living with them for so long that it actually uh, it's quite difficult to remember a time when we didn't actually have them. Uh, we um, are involved in grass moors in England and in Scotland. It used to be that we just thought the Scots were these rather strange people north of the border that had these problems. And then, sure enough, those problems came down to England. And uh, it, we in England now are in, uh, are we in the same position? No. If, however, uh, licensing of grass moors in Scotland is going to happen. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to it and we are now working very hard, Countryside Alliance, Scottish Land and Estates working very hard indeed to try and get a licensing system that is workable for those moors in Scotland. The danger of that, and we don't have any alternative, is that that will be seen as the template by a future government in England to have licensing of grass moors in England. The danger from there is if you can license grass shooting, why will you not license shooter? So, you know, am I an optimist? Yes. Have we been fighting battles for a bloody long time? Absolutely. Um, and there are more battles to come, they just keep changing. And, and perhaps the, the, the real message of that is that we who shoot need to be much better organised, much better committed, and much prepared to do more to defend our shooting than we are currently doing. Adrian. Mark, Mark's very right saying what happens north of the border can come south just too easily. Interestingly, it wasn't that long ago when vicarious liability was introduced into Scotland, and all the cries at the time were, 
it's going to be uh, introduced in doing them. Can you just and explain it with vicarious liability? What does it mean? Basically, if, if your keeper is guilty of a crime, you as the landowner, if you can, cannot prove that you have made or taken every effort to ensure that he is not going to commit a crime, you're actually responsible for that crime being committed. Um, and that, again, the RSPB were calling for vicarious liability to be introduced into England year after year after year on the basis that it, you know, it was working in Scotland. This has gone very quiet again. So if somebody runs over a, a, a hare or a buzzard on your ground, it's, it's your fault? I think that's probably stretching it a bit far. Um, but no, I mean, illegal persecution of Percy Gray. You know, if you've got a buzzard that's been shot, poisoned, or whatever, and you as a landowner cannot prove that you have written down in contracts and everything else that is totally up to... Um, so, so, sorry, you've got to write in a contract you must obey the law? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's, uh, that's extraordinary. Uh, Andrew, on the... Uh, uh, on the subject of buyer profile, the kind of people who buy grouse spores uh, these days, have they changed? Do they have longer hair and are they more likely to be vegan? Um, again, just probably talking about the uh, the English marketplace, I would suggest that the, the buyer profile that we're seeing um, remains very wealthy individuals. Um, often those that uh, in, have enjoyed um, uh, grouse shooting as um, either taking days or, or guests or even uh, taking leases or licenses who wish to um, uh, to invest uh, further into uh, into more than ownership. Um, I think the, we touched on earlier about what, what the type of owner is. I think that, that whole conservation piece and enjoyment of the environment it is not just about owning a grouse more to count the number of birds they've shot. Um, there's a much wider um, uh, piece to and, and responsibility um, that, that uh, owners are taking when they're looking at, uh, at buying more. Is that a, a reaction to the media against grouse shooting, the, the, the media that seems to, to dominate this debate? Well, whether it's a reaction or whether it's just a movement of society and just it, it, it is an acceptance that um, uh, there's great responsibility in owning more. Um, and um, in, in doing that, um, how one, one operates uh, is important to maintain the um, uh, that, that almost unwritten license um, to uh, to shoot. It's 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 a social license, I think. It's a lot of people use that Now you live in Yorkshire. Tell me about your MP. Our MP. Um, you may have heard him, um, Mr. Sunak. I don't know whether he was here yesterday. He was. He was. Uh... Well, he was possibly going to come this afternoon and possibly tomorrow, but he's just announced uh, that he wants to ban trophy imports, so he might be sensible to appeal to a different section of the Tory grassroots. Yeah, he pushed hard to um, to become accepted in the rural community, um, and um, I do remember hearing him when he was up at Labour Market, and uh, I think two old boys saw him. I said, ah, 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 seeing this new lad, ah, not really one of us, but he seems all right. He got that. He made a very passionate speech in favour of grouse shooting in the House of Commons, didn't he? I and mean, we, we have him down as somebody who supports our sport. Yeah, he is a supporter, and he's a supporter of the rural community. Um, certainly we see that on a local level. He gets he's very active, um, and, um, uh, and it's good to see. And it, I, I fear that he may not get the top job. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, Mark, can I ask you, 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 you have an interesting MP as well, don't you? Our MP is Victoria Prentice, which is one of, who is one of the three DEFRA and hence countryside ministers. We've got uh, Mr. Eustace at the top, and then we have Victoria, and we have Rebecca Powell underneath. Victoria is the only one that is, comes out. She's a farming family. Her father was a farmer and an MP. They have a family farm. She's a hunting family and a shooting family. So we in North Oxfordshire very luckily have her. Um, I am incredibly wary of MPs generally because I spent the last 30 years dealing with them um, and uh, uh, north and south of the border. Um, I cannot understand why Rishi Sunak, who is quite clearly um, represents Labour and a very strong field sports shooting community and has been very supportive. I cannot imagine what made him announce last night to ban trophy imports. I mean, trophy imports is the, the smallest possible. It cannot represent anything to 
other than 0.00001 of the population. And most of those, I think, would probably live in either Wimbledon uh, or Notting Hill or somewhere like that. I mean, the fact that someone goes to Africa and shoots a antelope or something like that, and that will be banned to come in, seems to me, given how many things we've got to be concerned about in the country, so low on our list of priorities. And I, I, it, it is that goldsmith factor. I, as you can probably imagine, I do get a little steamed up by this. I mean, the goldsmith factor just seems to be extraordinary. There are so many things that are going to affect us in the UK, and trophy imports does not seem to be to be a very big priority. The goldsmith factor, of course, means Zach Goldsmith, and it does it does smell of, of money changing hands, which we've been we've been told Richie doesn't need. Adrian, can I ask you? Uh, I mean, you are at the sharp end of, of lobbying these people. Who's going to be better for grouse shooting, Rishi or Liz? As we heard, um, Rishi is, is MP for Richmond. Um, he knows well. His constituency is full of some very, very nice grass balls, and he knows all the grass ball owners, and he is certainly extremely supportive and knows a lot about the sport. And all the background to it, all those employed, as I mentioned earlier, is, is the community aspect. It's not just about the more owners, it's not about the guns you come and shoot. It's about all those for whom it is really important, and for some, the main economic driver. And he will have full understanding of that. So the two, I'd have to say, Rishi would be more understanding and be supportive of grass shooting. He has got Dominic Raab as his second in command, who is part of the kind of animal rights rot at the heart of the Tory uh, government at the moment. I mean, that that could be where this is this this anti-shooting thing is coming from. One well, would hope he wouldn't be influenced by that. Um, certainly, an, an unfortunate um, selection. We'll just have to see. We'll just have to see. Right, um, back to uh, grouse shooting. Uh, I mean, we, we've, we've heard about the, the, the price of grouse, we've heard about the capital values of grouse, uh, and uh, perhaps um, the political reality of grouse. Um, can I ask you to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing? Um, where is grouse shooting going to be uh, in, in all those areas uh, over the next five to 10 years? What's going to happen to grouse shooting? Adrian, do you want to start with that one? Of all forms of shooting, grouse is probably the easiest to defend. It, it, it is so good <laughs> in so many respects. Um, as we've heard, it's a totally wild bird. If it wasn't for the management of those moors and the shooting, there wouldn't be grouse. There wouldn't be 75% of the, the world's heather in this country. It, it's a habitat of international importance, and it's entirely due to the management for grouse shooting that it's there. Um, and that, we, we've got to keep people informed, briefed, about all the good aspects about grass shooting and its management. So how is, is what we're doing? How is country? Yeah, so how is countryside lands doing that? Endless briefing in the media. So basically, whether it's in Parliament, in the media, on the ground, with influence policy makers, we've got to get that message across. And interestingly, it was what must be four years ago. I organised a visit to the Peak District of Cathy Bakewell, um, Lady Bakewell, who is the Lib Dem Ephra spokesperson of the Lords, who had never been on grass more before, after a two and a half uh, visit to this peak district more in the most appalling conditions, and she was wearing the most unsuitable clothing, she has actually turned out to be one of our biggest supporters of grass So you just she will, together there. It is all about education, and that is what we've all got to work on. Sorry, and just before I come to you, can I ask about the, uh, about the people you have to deal with? There's the media, there are the politicians, but there's also Yorkshire Water, there's also the regional and, and city councils, aren't there? That, you know, you've seen bans on grass shooting by, uh, by Bradford Council at Ilkley Hall. So you've got a huge breadth of people you have to talk to. It is virtually every aspect of society that one is trying to lobby, because there is such ignorance or lack of understanding out there. And it, the, the small vocal minority of groups like Wild Moors, they have a totally disproportionate amount of influence. Because people believe what they hear. It's the same with the RSPB. If the RSPB says X, Y, and Z, people go, oh, it must be true. Very frequently, it is not. It is totally unsubstantiated misinformation. 
Thank you. Hey, um, Andrew. Yeah, just on that, in terms of on a local level, what we're seeing is that the Moreland Keepers are really, really reaching out um, in their localities, and we're seeing school children going out for days on the moor, education days, um, and uh, they reach out to the community. So the WI will be involved, they'll be doing talks in the evenings, explaining the modern management, explaining what they're doing, the wider benefit of, um, of grass moor management. And I think that's really important, especially because we have seen where we live, a lot of the villages um, are not necessarily populated by what one would say natives. We've got a lot of incomes with a lot of holiday cottages. And there's a lot of people that don't understand. And it is all about, as you say, education and getting that message over. We've got uh, Basque's Let's Learn More. We've got the, uh, the, the local model organisations, as you say. Mark, if you were... Uh if, you, if there were an umbrella group uh, for all the future organisations, let's call it Aim to Sustain, and you were in charge of that, what, what would you do? I think, I think Aim to Sustain is an absolutely fantastic concept, and we all need to get behind it. What, why? Why? Because shooting, as we've discussed in the last 40 minutes, is and has been for a very long time, uh, receiving lots of different forms of attack in one form or another, and we need to have an umbrella organisation that brings all the shooting and landowning parties together, which was the aim of Aim to Sustain. What we need to do is to make it really effective to defend all forms of game shooting, not just moorland, grouse, but every form of shooting. Interestingly, just on that point, because we all think of you know, shooting has all sorts of different layers, but if you look at the hunting bill in Scotland, which has just been uh, published now, of which uh, the Scottish Countryside Alliance uh, director was talking about, that bill makes it an offence. So the purpose of the bill was to actually try and ban fox hunting, which the bill previously didn't actually successfully do in their minds. That bill, as now drafted, makes it illegal for any person to go out with the intention of shooting rabbits who does so with dogs that chase a rabbit. So it is now going to be illegal to chase a rabbit in Scotland? It, if the intent was to flush the rabbit, which if you go rabbit shooting, one assumes there is an intention to flush the rabbit to shoot it. It, it, it is, I mean, there is a logic gap in all this. They, they may uh, fall through the, the holes in the pavement where, uh, where, where they have in England, that if you want to prove that intention, you have to put the, the dog in the dog, don't you, and, and ask it what it thinks. Absolutely. So going back to the aim to sustain, this is the umbrella organisation of all Basque, Countryside Alliance, CLA, SLE, NGO, the National Game Keepers, etc. And we need to make that a really effective organisation that represents all of us across the country. Just imagine if we could have in every constituency a, a group of shooting people who immediately can lobby. I mean, we wouldn't, they just talked about Dominic Rapp. How did we get Dominic Rapp? who stood last time as a potential leader of the Tory party and therefore potential Prime Minister, and he's conservative against fox hunting, and he got elected, he got put in to a safe Surrey Conservative seat. It is absolutely bonkers. We should make sure that those people who represent us are not anti-field sports. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Adrian, can I just ask you to have one point from that? When you go to DEFRA, surely sitting around the table you've got the National Organisation of Titmouse Protection, the National Organisation of Reed Walkers, you've got a lot of people at the table because they're coming from a lot of disparate groups. Surely Aim to Sustain just gives you one seat at the table, whereas a, a diversity of organisations would give you a lot more. We still operate independently. So Aim to Sustain is the umbrella organisation, while like the SSC is for the um, all firearms shot. British right? Shooting Sports yeah, Council. Yeah. Um, and I, I just say that prior to Aim to Sustain, there was a Shoot Liaison Committee, which did bring all the organisations together, but it was not public facing. It had no public sort of frontage, which is what Aim to Sustain now has. So it is that which is so important. It, it couldn't have come too soon. So the Aim to Sustain, if you're doing a joint um, 
approach. Yes, that is the, the overarching way in which to do it, but each organization still operates very independently in its own manner. So, so that's important. There are moments when you need unity and there are times when you... Absolutely, because every, every organization works in a different way. The Countryside Alliance is a lot more um, outspoken, has a slightly different approach at times to others, but we do always try and ensure that we're coherent and complementary to all the other organizations, because it would be totally counterproductive not to be. But it's important to have our own identity and our own approach. Now, going back to the, uh, the crystal ball gazing, um, I think you've, you've said your piece. Uh, Andrew, can I ask you to, to look ahead? What's the, the market going to look like for grass moors in the five to ten years? Well, I think, I think it's challenging, uh, being very honest. I think um, that we've talked a lot about pressures. We've talked about um, licenses north of the border. Um, that could come further down. I think the attraction of the grass moor ownership will be under pressure. Um, however, um, supply and demand is a, a, a wonderful economic rules. Um, the, um, the so long as we have demand coming from individuals that really care about the sport and see the future um, and limited supply, values will, will keep where they are. If we don't, um, we'll be looking at different purchase types. Have you seen an example yet of somebody who has bought a grand small and turned it into something else? Not, not at scale and not south of the border. And we saw RSVB buy Gelt Stale and turn it into a reserve for apparently no birds, but <laughs> the, the aim was to put birds onto it, I think. Um, I, I, I can't think of any others like that. Mark, can you think of any that uh, could have done that? No, I don't think I can. South of the border in... in um, right. I, I'd actually say it's the opposite. Um, there's one particular moor which someone has taken the lease on for 10 years. Um, it's 15,000 acres. Uh, I'm not going to say where it is. And the person who's taken it on is pouring money into that management of the moor in infrastructure, which is not going to be his at the end of the day. I mean, he's just putting that money because he is passionate about bringing that moor back as it should be. So that's the, that's the opposite of turning it into woodland or whatever it is you're going to do. Yeah, no, absolutely, but that's as it brings it, I can't say it for the but So people are actually trying to improve the grass balls. As I said, there's a fine item I thought that we saw some of the great one from nothing, um, because grass is totally wild. Um, so no, I would say south of the border, it is, it is improvement as opposed to trying to change. But north of the border, we've seen tragedies like Lagan, haven't we? Uh, can, you, can you explain what's happened there? Well, Oh. Yeah, it's north of the border, it's, it's, it's rewilding, it's, it's carbon sequestration, it's, it's planting trees, it's, it's yeah. Uh, yes, it's brew dog, as Andrew says, it's, it's burning down forestry in order to plant forestry, yes. It's, uh, we couldn't save the city without destroying the city, could we? Um, Mark, um, uh, I think it's your go to do crystal ball gazing, please. Well, I'm an optimist, and if you're not an optimist, you shouldn't be involved in running grass for, um, because it, there's enough to make you very pessimistic just with the weather and the fortunes of how grass fare. So, um, will we continue to have pressures? Yes. Will there be different pressures increasing? Yes, because the ones we've got now, many of them we didn't think of 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. But good management, whether it's my neighbor on my right, or it's someone like us, or it's an individual, we, our job is to overcome those pressures and to hopefully deliver something which is sustainable, which I genuinely believe it is, and which um, people can enjoy, and which is an economic driver in rural areas. I mean, if you look at some of the moors that, that, that exist in the north of England, they're in parishes where there are no employers. When you think of farming now, there's very, very, very few full-time employed labour other than the family in the north of England and stock farms. We just don't get that now at all. You've got grass moors, so you've got parishes, farming rural parishes, where there is no big employers and you will find some of the moorland entities are the biggest employers in those areas. They're big economic drivers, they're big conservation drivers, they maintain a landscape which has been, the reason it's they were designated SSSIs was because in 1984 the government decided that they wanted to protect them as they are. 
and they weren't there because they were grass spores. I mean, that is the irony of what we now have to deal with with actual England. So um, I am optimistic. I think we've got lots of battles. We've got to fight those battles. But actually, we've got a very, very good case, as Adrian said. Thank you. Uh, Adrian, pick that up. Yes, on the question of sustainability, our grass more sustainable. Um, the University of Northampton published a report last August on that very subject. And um, the, the research was actually based on the three pillars of sustainability which were being identified by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which are environmental, economic and social. And looking at all the evidence, all the research, all the science, um, the, the, the conclusion was, yes, grass shooting is sustainable and anybody who is looking at changing the land use of grass wall needs to take into consideration those three pillars of sustainability identified by the IUCN and any change of use must be at least as beneficial as that which is currently in place if not more so. Okay, well grass moors are in something of a firing line because we saw the gloves come off at the IUCN conference last week in uh, Kigali where we saw for the first time established the, the, the consumable version of what you do with wildlife, that's people like us who go shooting, and the non-consumable version, which is the government-run national park where all wildlife is protected and phototourism is the, the only thing that's allowed. Now, if, if, th if that comes to the UK, then surely that is a threat. Well, it's only got to look at um, Moorhouse, a rather large moor in Upper Teesdale, which is surrounded by well-managed moors. That, I think that's about 18,000 acres. Mark will probably know better than me. Um, that is not managed at all. The heather is knee high. There's no wildlife on it. It is an enormous risk of wildfire. It's a complete disaster. And actually, we had the DEFRA up, up in the policy team visiting another moor in Upper Teesdale three weeks ago. Um, they were amazed by what they saw on this moor that was managed for grouse. And right next door to it was more house. We could look across it. And interestingly, this would actually be really interesting to go and look at Natural England's more house, more, and make a comparison. I said, yes, it would be. But a really good point that we have every year, we pay the BTO, British Trust for Ornithology, to come and do a, a non grouse count of bird species, particularly waders, on a big uh, moor in Northumberland. Um, the guy who comes up, two of them come up, um, he, I had tea with him this year in the spring after the camp. He said, you'll understand, he comes from Dartmoor, he said, you'll understand, I'm a birdie. I, shooting is a complete anathema to me. So I'm coming to an estate that is just, you know, riddled with gamekeepers and with grouse butts and all those sort of things. It is not my natural home. But he said, I have to say, this is the most awesome place I come to, and I go every three years to Antarctica, and the range of wildlife and the, the quantity of waders here is just absolutely unbelievable. And he said, so I said to him, well, tell me about Dartmoor. He said, don't, because I will cry. He said, I moved there 35 years ago, and he said, it is an absolute desert. Uh, on that same subject, um, Natural England actually commissioned a breeding bird survey of the North Pennine Special Protection Area about 14 years ago. Um, the majority of the North Pennine's SPA are managed grass moors, two are not. One is Gelt's Tail, that's going to up in the reserve, and the other one is Moorhouse. And all densities of important upland birds were on the managed grass moors. The only things in slightly higher numbers, uh, higher numbers on Gelstel and Moorhouse were carrying crows and other corbids. Well, there are threats for ground shooting in the next five to ten years, of which you know, predator species, scavenger species are, uh, are one. There are, um, there's heather beetle, of course. Um, one which really comes home to people here at the game fair is, is lead shot. Um, where are we on that at the moment? Because Dutch Sidelines, of course, is one of the organisations calling for voluntary removal of lead shot and plastic ones from countries. If we go back to the original lead ammunition group, you may remember that Countryside Alliance was one of the three organisations that worked against any um, further restrictions on these lead shot, let alone banning it. Because the, at the time, the evidence was not there to justify any further restrictions or a ban. Times have moved on. 
the evidence is there. It is harmful. We need to move on from there. That is why the organisations of the Council of Houses One went for the voluntary transition away from lead shock by 2025, which we thought would give the, the um, cartridge manufacturers sufficient time to come up with viable alternatives. Because it's not just getting rid of lead shock, it's having a, an alternative lead shock with a biodegradable wad. Steel's there now, but it's with plastic wads. And what, it's not really acceptable for having plastic wads literally in the countryside, um, which is why it has to be the lead with a biodegradable wad. Covid, sorry, Covid pandemic. It's, <laughs> it's a very easy mistake to make. Um, the Covid pandemic has had real implications on supply chains and supply issues. The steel comes from China, the majority of the steel has been going to, to um, the United States. So that's had real implications on the cartridge manufacturers. They are making enormous progress. There, there are some on the market now. They're very effective. They've been tried. And you're working with them? And we're working very closely with them. Okay. Um, but we had to give the voluntary transition. Whether there will be sufficient uh, supply to meet demand by 2025 is another question, in which case we'll have to go for, uh, again, it's a voluntary transition, um, yeah. but you know, we, we've got to go down that route. I think Mark's about to beat you up. I just want to do a quick, uh, a quick uh, straw poll here in the audience. Uh, the trouble with asking you something is, you know, uh, there are a few of you, put your hands up and then feel crushed by everybody else, or everybody puts their hands up. Who here has transitioned away from lead in their shooting so far? Partly, half, a couple of halves. Who here feels that they are not going to be able to transition away from lead at all? Okay, that's, so those are our two extremes. Uh, is, is everybody broadly happy with the idea of transitioning away from lead? It's going to happen. My MP's Rebecca Power, she's going to bring a reception here. So we've got, we got actually more support for that. Who believes that uh, the organisations could have handled it better? Quite a lot more for that. Right, Mark, you may now ritually kick Adrian off the stage, if you like. appreciate that William Powell is fairly heavily involved in guns and cartridges. Um, we have a very close relationship with one of the leading cartridge manufacturers. Um, the problem, the, the idea was not wrong. Um, you can debate whether or not lead uh, should cartridges should continue to be used or not forever. The direction of travel is set. The government have made it absolutely clear we've got to tr transition. The problem is the time scale. There are, in 2019, 232 million cartridges sold in the UK. Unfortunately, the, our organisations don't seem to know some of these facts. Um, 80 million of those were sold were game cartridges. In 2019, we estimate there were 250,000 non-lead cartridges made, sorry, sold in the UK. 80 million game cartridges, 250,000 were non-lead. Soft iron, which is steel, comes from China. Even the Chinese, who open coal fields weekly, think it's polluted. Amazing. Okay? Double burning powder, Steel is a less effective, it is less lethal, that is a fact of life, than lead if you had an equalisation. Look at the metal state. The problem is to get the steel propellant enough, you have to have a double burning powder. Double burning powder is made in America, and the Americans are now terrified by Ukraine and war. So we have a supply chain problem which is extraordinary. We can't get yellow cases, new yellow cases for 20 years are not available at the current time, okay? So we've got a transition from 250,000 non-toxic cartridges to 80 million. And the problem is we have, are not going to do it within the time scale. That is the problem. I'm, I'm going to have, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up. I, I can't, Adrian, you've got to answer that. Uh, he, he did kick you a couple of times, you heard him. He's done it frequently before. As I said, yeah, the, the supply chains are an issue. It's a very real one. And it's only been ignored totally by all those, again, the ICBs calling for a, a ban or a voluntary ban by the 2024 season. Okay. And it's not going to happen. Right, gentlemen, thank you so much for telling us about Grouse and all the issues around it. Please, can you give a round of applause to Andrew Fanny, Mark Osborne, and Adrian Blackmore? Thank you.